Well, all I can say is, wow. Are you like that? Whew. That was fantastic. And our subject this morning is on holiness. And if you'd like to have a Bible to follow along, these gentlemen would love to put one in your hands uh, on their way through. Make sure that you receive one. Uh, our subject this morning is the holiness of God as we are embarked on a uh, study dealing with the attributes of God. We come this morning in earnest to holiness. A few weeks ago we had uh, music that was all about the holiness of God. That service was awesome as far as the music is concerned, if you ask me. And today was just the same. It was just fantastic when we stopped to consider the holiness of God. R.C. Sproul said the Bible says that God is holy, holy, holy. Not one holiness, not two, but three holinesses. When I was teaching in uh, China, I was teaching about the hermeneutic of uh, Scripture and understanding how we interpret it. One of the things that stands out is when we see words repeated, we know that they are of great importance. Jesus said, verily, verily, or truthfully, truthfully, and he underscores the importance for paying attention to that text. Here we look at the Scripture. The Scripture says, holy, 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 when speaking of God. He's not merely holy or even holy, holy. He is holy, holy holy. The Bible never says that God is love, 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 mercy, 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 or wrath, 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 or justice, justice, justice. It does say that he is, however, holy, holy, holy. The earth is full of his glory. May the Lord teach us this morning. May we understand the significance of his holiness to some degree today. As we look into scripture, let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning not fully aware of what your holiness entails, not fully understanding what it really means to be holy, for we truly are not. Help us, Lord, this morning as we look at Scripture to get a glimpse into the significance of your holiness. Help us, Lord, to, to understand it. And help us, Father, to understand what you expect from us, your followers. Bless the word, I pray today, in Jesus' wonderful name, amen. When we stop and we think about holiness, there are uh, different things that come to mind. Some of them are uh, a little bit shy, I believe, of the true understanding that we should have. When we stop and think about holiness, holiness means to be, in essence, it means to be distinct or to be separate. In the case of God, we are talking about someone who is in a class all by himself. The Greek word agios in the uh, New Testament uh, means to set something apart, to set it aside, and in that way we make it holy, and God is much more than just that. In fact, when we stop and we think about God, the ancient word uh, for holiness going way back is to mean uh, to be a cut above something, to cut it out and to separate it, and it is distinct, and it is, it is better than the rest, which means that there is only one who is holy, God alone is holy. He is uniquely holy. He has no competition, and he has absolutely no rivals. When the Bible says that God is holy, he is, he is transcending all things, and he is separate unto himself. The concept of holiness is very difficult for me to understand. And so for you today, if you walk away and you sit there and say, I'm not sure I fully grasp it, understand that I simply would agree to that. To be holy is to be otherworldly. Because I am not holy, I struggle with the understanding of the holiness of God. It is far easier for me to understand the power of God and the goodness of God than it is to wrap my head around the holiness of God. In fact, the more that I studied for this message and dealing with scriptures pertaining to the holiness of God, how inadequate I felt in approaching this subject. And I agree with the passage in Exodus chapter 15, verse 11. It says, Who is like thee among the gods, O Lord? Who is like thee, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders? 1 Samuel chapter 2 answers that question. It says, there is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides thee, nor is there any rock like our God. You see, our God is so unique. He is 
otherworldly. His holiness transcends all that I can know and understand. Understand that not only does it mean to be distinct or separate, but it also means to be pure, to be morally pure. Uh, when things are holy and they're consecrated, they're set apart to God in, in purity. And we would understand that when it comes to, to purity, purity is not excluded from the idea of holiness. It's contained within it. What we need to understand and remember is that the idea of the holy is never exhausted by the idea of the purity aspect because pure doesn't say everything that holiness says. Thirdly, for God to be holy is for him to be holy in relation to every other aspect of his being, to everything within creation. You see, God is holy and, and it permeates all of the other attributes of God. Some would even say that holiness really isn't an attribute of God. It's, it's, it's truly an essence thing. And I would agree with that. God in his very essence, and when I use the word essence, essence just simply means it's what makes God God. God is holy. But understand that that holiness transcends into all the other areas. It means his love is holy, his justice is holy, his wrath is holy, his righteousness is holy. Every aspect of our God is holy. Isn't that wonderful? And as the song is, is sung and we lift up our voices to sing about the holiness of God, we need to understand that, that truly it's beyond even our ability to comprehend. How important is holiness for us to understand? Well, if you take your Bibles, I want to show you a passage here in Isaiah chapter 6 this morning. Isaiah chapter 6. The Bible says here in Isaiah 6 that God was getting ready to use the prophet Isaiah. And in chapter 6, he begins to talk about a vision that he received. And it happens after King Uzziah's death. He says, in the year of his death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. And Isaiah begins to describe this vision. This is a time, by the way, in the period of history of Israel, that the good times are over and we're about ready to start on the hard times. And Isaiah is called by God to come and to preach to the people of Israel. And so he's going to give to Judah the, the important words that God is going to place in his mouth. But it says here that when he's, he's there and he sees this vision, the first thing he sees is the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty, and exalted. We just got through singing that song, high and lifted up, right? And that's what he's talking about here. He says, with the train of his robe filling the temple, seraphim, those angels, stood above him, such as having six wings, two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Now, this is Isaiah's vision. Can you imagine seeing a vision like that? I'll tell you what, you'd wake up in the morning slightly changed, wouldn't you? And the Bible says that Isaiah's response to what he witnessed was to say, Woe is me, for I am ruined. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. For Isaiah, he thought to himself, woe is me, I am in trouble. Because here I am, God's asking me to speak, he's going to put the words in my mouth, and the very words upon my lips are corrupted. And he thought to himself, woe is me, I am not ready to do this job. Have you ever wondered what the reasons were why God gave Isaiah that vision? I'm sure it was to prepare his heart. I think if I was a prophet back in those days, uh, I might think pretty good of myself. You know, God comes and says to you, to you. God comes and says to you, listen, I've got a job for you to do. You're going to tell these knuckleheads, to get right with me, or I'm going to bring destruction upon him. Now, I'm just saying, if God did that to me, I would be tempted to think more highly of myself than I should. Huh, 
<laughs> I'll tell them whatever you want me to tell them, God. Hey, yo, yo, you, you. God is going to rain down fire upon your sorry hide. <laughs> there, I said it. What happens to Isaiah as he experiences this vision, as he comes in contact to this vision with the holiness of God, as he sees himself as he really is? He sees himself as a sinner. He is a sinner ministering among sinners. I the same. You see, by ex being exposed to the holiness of God, it puts everything into its right perspective, doesn't it? And he is no doubt humbled when he realizes, woe is me. How can I go to these people? How can I tell them that they're sinners? How can I call upon them to repent when my very lips are corrupted with sin? The Bible says one of the seraphims flew to me with a burning coal in his hand in this vision. And he says, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. And he touched my mouth with it and said, behold, this has touched your lips. And your iniquity is taken away and your sin is forgiven. Isaiah, God has a job for you. And your heart is to be right with me. You're to see yourself as you truly are. But also understand that there is a purpose for your ministry. And your ministry is to get my word to these people. The holiness of God struck Isaiah in reality. And he understood from a godly perspective his role that God had placed upon him. Now, not everyone's like this in the scriptures. In fact, if you take your Bibles, I want to show you another example. Go back with me to 1 Samuel chapter 5. 1 Samuel chapter 5. Because what we're doing this morning is we're going to contrast the reverence of Isaiah in looking at his own life. And even though God had singled him out for a purpose, he recognized in a healthy manner where he stood in relationship to the one true holy God. Now when you go back to 1 Samuel, you see in chapter four that the Philistines had taken the Ark of the Covenant. They'd taken the Ark of God and taken possession of it because there was a victory that was won and they had the opportunity to do that. This happens in chapter four. You remember Indiana Jones and the, the, whatever those series were? You remember how the, the Germans were looking for the Holy Grail, thinking to themselves, if we can get our hands on that, uh, somehow we'll have all kinds of power. Uh, well, I think the Philistines thought the same thing. They thought to themselves, hey, listen, now we're going to have the upper hand because we have possession of the Ark of God. Well, over in chapter 5, we find out it's not working out that way for them. In chapter 5, we read uh, that they took the ark of God, they brought it to the house of Dagon, and set it by Dagon. Now, who in the world is Dagon? Dagon is an idol. It's a false god that the Philistines would bow down and worship. Well, here's the strange thing. Well, when the Ashdites, uh, Ashdites arose early the next morning, verse 3, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. <laughs> God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? Okay, they came out in the morning and go, oh, our idol, I mean Dagon. Oh, oh, they brushed him off, you know, and <laughs> set him up. There he is. And the Bible says that, um, you know, the same thing's going to happen. Uh, they took him, they set him in his place again. But when they arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon uh, had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. You know, if this keeps going on, he's going to break his wooden nose, and then we're really going to have trouble here. Well, it didn't stop there. God, uh, the Bible says, uh, ravaged these people in verse 6 uh, with uh, tumors. And uh, tumors can't be a lot of fun. And they got sick and tired of all of this. And they thought to themselves, I don't think we've got anything special here. We've got to get rid of it. And so they decided they were going to get rid of it. So they sent the ark, verse 10, they sent the ark of God uh, to Ekron. And the ark of God came to Ekron. The Ekronites cried out saying, they brought the ark of God of Israel to us to kill us and our people. Uh, so the Ekronites, uh, they're not real fond of this either. And they think to themselves, we're all going to die uh, because they brought the Ark of God to us. By the time you come to chapter 6, now they've decided to send it back. So we're going to send this back to Israel. And so the Bible says that they made a little cart for the Ark of God to sit on. 
And they took a couple milk cows, and uh, they, they took their calves, and the calves couldn't go with them. And they, these were just pristine cows. And they were going to head on up towards Israel. And they were going to do something nice because they didn't want the wrath of God to be upon them. And so they decided to put a guilt offering along with the ark of God and send it on up the road. Uh, and so they thought to themselves, you know, what, is, what would be touching? And then they thought to themselves, let's make tumors out of gold. Whatever. Not my idea of a great gift. But whatever. And let's put uh, five gold mice in there. Uh, to Each one stood for one of the Lord of the Philistines. And uh, that's what we're going to do. And you'll notice here in the passage something interesting. Uh, let me just point it out to us here in verse 8. Take the ark of the Lord and place it on the cart and put the articles of gold which you return to him as a guilt offering in a box by its side. Huh. Well, that's just kind of interesting. I'll get back to that in a moment. So they send these couple of cows with the Ark of the Covenant on up there, and they're unmanned. They just send them on up the road. In fact, they said to themselves, if they end up going to Beth Shemesh, then we know that God was angry with us, and if they just kind of wander around, then we know it's just kind of fate and circumstances. Well, you know where they went. They went right to Beth Shemesh. Well, there in chapter 6, uh, we read there in verse 15, the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the box that was with it in which were the articles of gold. So you have some Levites here in Beth Shemesh. And they must have been taking the leadership here with all of this. Well, they checked out all of the gold pieces that were in there and they thought this was great. But in verse 19, we read about something absolutely horrible. Verse 19 says this. He, being God, struck down the sons of the men of Bashemesh. And do you see the reason? Because they looked into the ark of the Lord. It was not their responsibility. It was not their role to do that. They weren't consecrated to the Lord to do that. You have Levites there who should know all of these things. Amen? Amen. Where's their leadership? Where's their guidance? It seems like even the Philistines knew as much when they took the guilt offering and instead of putting it inside the ark, they, they attached it alongside of it. There seems to be even more reverence on their part than you find here among these people in Beth Shemesh. And the Bible tells us the number of people killed. Now, you want to stop and think about it. Do you remember when the people of Israel, I'll just give you this because we were all together for that series in Joshua. When the people went up to Ai and they didn't inquire of the Lord, do you remember how many people died? 36, that's right. Do you know how many people died here in Beth Shemesh? 50,070. Read it right there in your Bible. 50,000, and don't forget the 70. He didn't round off the number. And I'm serious, that's significant. God doesn't say, well, you know, there's 50,000. He says, 50,070. Wow. 50,070 men died because they looked into the Ark of the Covenant. You begin to understand the Ark of the Covenant is a place where the glory of God was residing, and, and this was to be in the middle of the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle, in the temple area, and so forth. We don't know where the Ark of the Covenant is today, do we? Or do you? If anybody knows where it is, tell me afterwards. I think it's in one of the walls in the old city, but I can't prove it yet. Take your Bibles and go with me to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel in 2 Samuel, we begin to read about David and what he was going to do. The Bible says that David now is, is gathering steam, and the Bible says that David gathered all the chosen men of Israel, which totaled 30,000. David arose and he went with all the people who were with him to Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the very name of the Lord of hosts who is enthroned above the cherubim. I have that word name capitalized in my Bible. Now for 20 years, if you go back to 1 Samuel, you don't have to do it, but 1 Samuel chapter 7 tells us that for 20 years, uh, this was housed in the home of uh, Eliezer, the house of Abinadab, the one that's up on the hill, the Bible adds. 
but it's there for 20 years. So David is going to take the Ark of the Covenant, and he's going to bring it on up to Jerusalem. And so here we are, and we're looking into this passage, and the Bible says in verse 3, they placed the Ark of God on a new cart that they might bring it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahiah, the sons of Abinadab, were leading the new cart. Now, let me ask you a question, those theologians in the mix. What is wrong with that particular picture? It's not supposed to be on a cart. That's Muslim, a la carte. (laughs) Just seeing if you're awake. (laughs) That's all, just seeing if you're awake. They had, when God gave the prescription for how to build this all, there were rings on the ark of God, and there were long wooden staves that were to go through, and it was to be hand-carried, wasn't it? So the problem occurs here In chapter 6, when they come to the threshing floor, the Bible says they came to the threshing floor of Nakon, there was a problem. You see, it was a dirt road going up to the threshing floor, but the threshing floor was made out of stone. And as that cart hit the edge of the stone, the cart began to tip. And when the cart began to tip, Uzzah descendant of Abinadab here, is going to reach out and he's going to stabilize the cart, the very cart that the ark of God was not to be upon. And the Bible says for that gesture, he died. Uzzah reached out towards the ark of God, took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah and God struck him down there for his irreverence. Did you see that? for his irreverence. Do you think the holiness of God really matters? Do you really think it has an impact on our lives? 50,070 men died because they looked into the ark of God. Uzzah died because he reached out to stabilize it. You see, the very nature of God's holiness brings with it some significant requirements. The reverence of God. The Philistines went through difficulties. Dagon couldn't stand on his two feet, and they had tumors, that is true, that they were afflicted with, but the record doesn't show us that any of them died. But here, 50,000 plus end up dying, including one, Uzzah, who was doing this, you say, out of good intention. But the holiness of God and the requirements that God had set forth were not obeyed. If we were to go back on through uh, in the Old Testament, you would find that God specifically said that it was to be carried in that way so that no one would touch it and die. God gave warning, and God was true to his word. When we come to the New Testament, we come to the New Testament, we're introduced uh, in the Gospels to Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus is obviously holy. In fact, the Bible would tell us in Luke chapter 1 and verse 35, uh, in talking to Mary, it says this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. We know that God is holy. We know that Jesus Christ is God and Jesus Christ is then holy. Jesus Christ was not conceived by a human being in the sense that there was a sin nature passed down. You recall that Mary conceived by virtue of the Holy Spirit of God. And so Jesus never had a sin nature like you and I have. In fact, the entire life of Christ is lived in such a way as to show forth true holiness. 
And Jesus is the embodiment of that holy living that is so significant. And we see the holiness of Christ as it's, it's demonstrated in his mannerisms and his actions. The miracles, the signs, all of those things. And by the time you come to Revelation, you begin to see how holy Jesus truly is. And for sake of time this morning, we can't go there and explore those passages. But, but read it sometime and notice the holiness of Jesus Christ as it's spoken about there in the end book of the New Testament. I draw your attention this morning to Ephesians chapter 5, a passage of scripture that's often used in weddings. But it has a great deal to say. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, this is that great passage, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the what? The church. And he gave himself up for her, the church, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be, what? Holy and blameless. Holy and blameless. There is coming a day when we, as the part of the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, the bride is going to be presented to the groom, Jesus Christ, and we will be presented blameless, without spot, because of the forgiving work of Jesus Christ. All those who come to Christ in faith will have their sin blotted out, and as part of the body of Christ, will be presented to Jesus and how wonderful that will be. We have a holy Jesus welcoming his holy church, and how joyous that will truly, truly be. In the meantime, it is very important for you and I to demonstrate our allegiance to Jesus Christ. And I want to point out a passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, this is typical because this is our our communion or our Lord's Supper passage of Scripture. And we have the Lord's Supper that we'll be observing here in a few minutes. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is pretty honest with these believers. And he points out a problem. He says, in giving this instruction, I'm in verse 17, but in giving this instruction, I do not praise you, he says. So if you aren't going to get praised, you're probably going to get what? Scolded or chewed out. So this is what he says. Because you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. Uh, For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, in part I believe it. And he goes on and he addresses that. Then he says in verse 29, or verse 20, he says, therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Hmm. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one's hungry, and another's drunk. Well, that's a problem. Uh, you see, in the early church, there was something called Uranus uh, that was a banquet where there was no host. Uh, so you didn't come in in the typical oriental type of hospitality where a host was there. The host would, would provide you with clean water to wash your hands and prepare for the meal. And the host would sit you in the spot that they selected for the meal. That's the host's role. This was more of a free-for-all, you know, kind of an all-church type of dive-in-for-food type of thing. Uh, it's kind of like a potluck dinner. Uh, you brought your food. And when we have a potluck dinner, we bring food and we put it on a big long table and we let people share each other's cooking. Right? You with me? Those are fun. But not in 1 Corinthians 11. In 1 Corinthians 11, there's a problem. The problem was, I would make my favorite dish. Ooh. And it smelled so good. And I made sure I got there early so I could eat it myself. Now, there's a problem with that. First of all, it doesn't show a lot of love, does it? No. 
And uh, there would be people who would come on time, and there would be people who come late. And some of the people who came late didn't get anything at all to eat. Maybe they were poorer people. But, you know, we're rich people, so we're going to bring, oh, man, I got steak tips, and I got, oh, yeah, hollandaise sauce, and I got all this good stuff, and I'm going to sit down 15 minutes before everybody shows up. I'm going to eat the whole thing. And Paul says, listen, some of you are filled up and happy and even to the point where some of them had drunk a lot of booze and now they're intoxicated. That's a problem, isn't it? So you got these people that have gorged themselves, that have drunk way too much, and now here you have a problem. And there's people coming in, they've got absolutely nothing to eat, and all the while we're going to take of the Lord's Supper. Paul says, that's not how you do it. And he says to them, What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? In other words, take your food, take your meal at home. Don't mingle the Lord's Supper with Arenas, that meal. Or do you despise the church of God? And catch that last part. Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I will not praise you. You see, there was a problem here. In fact... Paul goes on after that, and he begins to talk about the Lord's Supper. And uh, you know that passage. I I read it just about every month. And he says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We we understand all that. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, he says, many are, whew, many are weak and sick, and a number sleep, which is a euphemism for death. God looked at what the early church was doing and how they were violating the Lord's Supper by having these lavish parties ahead of time and not taking responsibly what was going on. Now, you English experts, I think it is in the King James, it says, whoever eats and drinks of the cup of the Lord in a, an unworthily, I think is the word they use in the King James. In my New American Standard, it says, uh, in an unworthy manner. Uh, what, what grammatical expression is that? Anybody? No one got it in the first service either. I feel sorry for the kids who are going to grow up and say to their parents, listen, what helped me with my English? I don't know. I don't have got a clue. Um, it, it's actually an adverb. And that's to be contrasted by an adjective. Uh, now, an adjective, if it was an adjective, and God said the problem is some are coming and they're eating and drinking un- unworthily or in an unworthy that would deal with us as individuals. Now, not one of us comes to the Lord's table worthily in the sense that, we're, we're worth it. In other words, we have to come because we're cleansed by virtue of our faith in Jesus Christ. No, 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 not one of us is, is worthy enough to come and, and partake. But what he's using here is an adverb. So what he's saying is the reason that some of you are dying and some of you are sick and have died is because you adverb now, you come in an unworthy manner. The way in which you approach the Lord's table, I believe here, shows irreverence. And as such, there was consequence for that action. And so it's a very important thing that we understand that in the early church they needed to correct that. One of the reasons why we don't have a big banquet associated with the Lord's Supper is because we don't want to violate this scripture. Let's come to the Lord's Supper for the elements that are here and let's have the spiritual emphasis on the work of Christ on the cross. And let's not mingle the two. It's fine to have a church dinner. We can do that tonight. But let's just have this here alone. You can even have a church dinner and then come over here and have this. You just need to separate them, you see, because there were problems that were going on. Not that I would think that we would act or behave uh, like these believers here in 1 Corinthians 11. Here's the point. The point is, God is still a holy God today, isn't he? And his holiness requires us to have a certain reverence present in our life. Now, it's important for us to remember because I believe the the appropriate response to the holiness of God is, first of all, that we fear God. 
I believe every one of us needs to have a reverence for God. And we need to be careful how we even approach the name of God. Because there is only one who's truly holy. And he is our God. We also need to, to be very careful in how in which we live our life. I believe that a life that, that shows forth holiness is what God expects from his followers. And as I was doing, as I was doing this uh, study, uh, one of the conclusions that I came to uh, was, and in the verse that kept popping into my mind was, to whom much is given, much is required. You know, it, the tumors didn't kill people in Philistia. But those people who knew not to look into the ark should have known not to look into the ark. And these Christians back here in 1 Corinthians 11 needed to understand that there needed to be reverence paid to the Lord's Supper. Brings about the passage in mind, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 14 through 19. It says this. It says, those obedient children do not be conformed to the former lusts in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in your behavior. Because it's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each man's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay, that is your life here on earth, knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless. This one who is Christ. This morning, I trust that our life will be a reflection of Jesus Christ. God desires for us to follow him. In 1840, Dan Edwards was ordained as a missionary to the Jews. Uh, and after his ordination, he received the following letter of exhortation from the, uh, the Scottish preacher, Robert Murray McShane. He says, I trust you will have a pleasant and profitable time in Germany. I know you will apply hard to German, but do not forget the culture of the inner man, I mean of the heart. How diligently the cavalry officer keeps his saber clean and sharp, every stain he rubs off with the greatest care. Remember, you are God's sword, his instrument. I trust a chosen vessel unto him to bear his name. In great measure, according to the purity and perfection of the instrument, will be the success. It is not great talents God blesses, so much as great likeness to Jesus. A holy minister is an awful weapon in the hand of God. Would you bow your heads with me, please? And as our